Uh, I am Sudeep Maharana. Um, I am currently working as an executive vice president um, in a company called Bark. We predominantly work in data and uh, I have been in the AI field for some time now and uh, been a very rich, fulfilling experience to work in this new field of technology. My background, I'm a computer engineer. I'm a pass out of NIT at Kala. I did my computer engineering, uh, I completed my computer engineering in the year 2000, after which I worked with a lot of companies like IBM, Oracle, Bearing Point, KPMG. I, like most of the software engineers have lived and worked, worked around the world. So be it US, UK. Okay, I heard someone saying I'm not audible. Is it clear now? Am I audible clearly? Okay, I'm assuming I'm audible. All right. So um, now I'm in AI, which is, which is fantastic. Uh, I love doing this work um, and uh, I'll walk you through my experiences as to what you can do moving your career from what you are doing today to into the AI space. Yeah, and pardon me that I don't know each of you personally. So my generic, uh, it will be my personal comments uh, as to what I have seen in my career and what I have seen as a growth path. So we'll, we'll see how it goes. Okay. I'll open for questions towards the end, which is after 20 minutes. All right, here we go. So uh, you clearly know that uh, the jobs landscape is clearly shifting towards data and AI. If you see in the top 10 emerging technologies, data science, so data analyst comes first, then AI machine learning, then if you come to number Four, it is software applications development and analysts. If you go to number six, there's big data specialist. Big data seven, then there's digital transformation, which also includes AI. Um, organizational development in IT services. These are the places where AI will play a role. So in so many ways, out of the top 10, bulk of it is data and AI, which is amazing. So right, right, carried ahead. Um, worthy of all the effort you put into it. Jumping into it, um, what you will clearly see is um, there are two primary roles in the data world, data engineer and data scientist. So um, a, a colloquial definition is data scientist is someone who knows less programming and more statistics. A data engineer is a one who knows more programming and less statistics. Okay, But this most companies who are not matured in the path of AI, confused between these two roles. They think data scientist, data engineer, data engineer, data scientist. Um, and we'll talk about where you can play as a role as a person looking to change your career, looking to make, it, make a switch, right? Um, so these are two primary roles. Uh, obviously there are bigger roles, there are, there are newer roles coming up like data art, data architect. Um, there, is, there are so many other roles, right? Um, we'll talk about it as we go forward. But predominantly if you see there are two big buckets data engineering and data scientist. From a technology perspective, I tell you data engineering is someone, data engineering is the back end of data scientist. Data scientist only focuses on the patterns around data. Data engineer predominantly gives data scientists the access of the data, meaning all the multiple data points, all in multiple systems, the data science engineer brings it together and places it in, in front of data scientists, data scientists to work on. Make sense? There's a third field, data visualization. I deliberately kept it separate because data visualization is again a mix around UI, UX, and data. Not all statisticians are very good in visualizing data. Most engineers are horrible in visualizing data. Companies like Tableau, ClickSoft, Sysense, Apply, um, Pivot, uh, Superset, all is playing in this, in this space. It's important, I'll tell you why it's important. It is important for decision making by executives. So this is data visualization there is mostly used by the top executives to make fast, quick decisions, uh, building data sets. So all, all the work data engineer does, and the data scientist does, culminates in a decision making process, which does in data visualization, right? Uh, quickly switching gears, there is natural language processing, right? So natural language processing, I mean, you must have heard all these terms before. So NLP is, is a clear area where you do sentiment analysis. The idea is 
until social media came into picture most of the data was structured data oracle kind of days right but with social media coming into picture in a big way we have natural language english hindi french those data being trying to be uh, understanding those data points is becoming more and more important has natural language processing is another big area we'll talk about, i'll talk more about what it goes okay um so if you see the ai stack there are three clearly stacks one is artificial intelligence machine learning learning so artificial intelligence is 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 a big bucket of ai and deep learning is a subset of machine learning okay uh, i can i'll talk to you about it okay here i'm switching gears from traditional machine learning to deep learning we spoke about three buckets earlier right so this is switching gear from classical so if you see here the classical machine learning which is predominantly statistical based data modeling which basically says that let me look at the data from a data perspective only right? and try to manually build rules around it using statistics as a background engine and develop the whole engine that's called statistical machine learning i can say it is called deep learning in deep learning uh, what we do is you basically let the computer decide all the rules the models in a non linear fashion the advantage and disadvantage of both the, in the classical world logic around what you are doing in the deep learning world there sometimes is a gray area as to why a computer decide something something on this right explain what deep learning is hence most companies today moving into the ai space focus on the classical machine learning space they have not matured on deep learning as much but if you see a google or a facebook or the startups world they have they are doing more work on deep learning and less work on classical machine learning because they realize the potential is much higher in deep learning compared to classical machine learning this is where computer vision comes into picture right? so computer vision is an area where you are identifying objects identifying objects can be done by rules by statistics looking at the program looking at the pixels that's classical machine learning but if you can pick it up deep learning networks tensor flow to pick it up then they will start doing this this is done through yolo computer vision deep learning right so this is where a, a person does not sit down together and say this is an object the computer autom automatically detects based on the past learning that this is an object this is a car this is a person on a cycle or something like that that's deep learning so um, i am quickly putting in the rpa stack because sometimes people get confused between robotic process automation and ai um, rpa started as an automation on the last mile so things which you cannot integrate technically you can do it through robotic process automation um, rpa is also slowly moving out of the last mile into the ai layer because as the systems are changing i rpa is, was Finding it difficult to be productive and uh, evolving. You know, this RPA is more playing in the cognitive layer, which is another advanced form of AI. So, if you see here, the cognitive layer which is another advanced form of AI. Okay. Uh, now, talking about things which you can do, how do you carry it and move and things like that. Okay. So, if you see here, the last turn of business is the business unit, business users. Then you would see Hadoop, Spark admins, ETL developers, business analyst. Then you'll have data analyst, and you know, data scientist, data architect, and things like that. So where does it play? Most companies will shift from the current application stack to a data stack. And this migration is a good Five, 10 years migration for large companies it's a much longer migration because there's so much baggage on the past but forward this migration will happen so most companies will start having chief data officers data operations just like your it ops you will have data ops right my company has my company has data ops my company has data data office my company has data head right so as you go forward you start seeing more and more of it so there will be complete separate created just focus towards um because of these areas so what are the what are the key areas so if you see here there will be a 
infrastructure stack, which is predominantly a Hadoop Spark layer, which you would know, right? A stack on data engineer, which is mostly around taking data out of Hadoop Spark stack and marrying it together to be usable, because until it is usable, the data scientist cannot come into picture. Then the data scientist comes to picture. So the data scientist comes to picture and says that, how can I use this data, patterns, and bring more to the data points. Okay. So most companies will move towards it. Um, this is a very for most companies. The problem is most companies don't know how to go about it. And that's when they would typically, they don't have clear definitions of what a data scientist would do, what a big data architect would do, what a data analyst would do. These terms are new. Most CIOs struggle with this, these terms because they don't know these terms anymore uh, from the past. And hence it becomes very difficult to, for them to write a good job description for these areas. So when you start focusing on these areas, you would find these terms being used together, right? And you should be able to, um, you are not at a point to tell that, hey, you are wrong. This is a data scientist role. This is a data engineer role. Uh, as, a, as a person looking for a job, you have to understand that terms will be used, juggled up, and you have to be understanding that it's fine. It's fine. And you have to, you have to in each of these pockets in some ways bad thing about the new area because there's so much in confusion some people who are working in the Hadoop Spark layer will expect the data scientist to know that right and or other way around some people working in the data Hadoop layer would be expected to know what data scientists would know right? so because the job descriptions are not clear because it is not clear what the role will do so as a as a person who's looking for interviews, you have to be knowing about all the three four areas. You might specialize in a particular area. For example, you might specialize in Hadoop. You might specialize in an architecture. You might specialize in ETL. You might specialize as a data scientist. But you have to be clear as you communicate in the, in the job world that you know all the four areas well enough. Okay, and you know the impact of all the four areas in the in the organization. Okay, we'll talk a little bit more about it as we go forward. Deep dive on the roles again, right? So uh, you are, let's say, you are a software engineer or a um, more an engineer from a data perspective, past an Oracle world. Then where does data engineer come into picture and where does data scientist come into picture? So if you see here, in the legacy days, let's put it right. So you've been predominantly working on a Java, C++, Oracle, MySQL, SQL Server, Web Services, jQuery here. So really move into this space which is data warehousing, ETL, um, ETL, ELT, the new terms, Hive, Hadoop, Spark, come into picture here, right? Some of you guys will move into this space, which is BI, so Python, big data, analytics is coming into picture. And then some will, some statistical guys will go into data scientists. This is a brand new area where you work very closely with the statisticians to make it work. Okay, so if you start having questions, we'll talk to you on this. So as you see here, um, you cannot do, not you cannot, uh, in most cases, most of the companies will have a cloud footprint. Uh, primarily two reasons. One, um, we don't know how to go about the new tech stack. So Hadoop, Spark, how many servers will I need? Right? Um, so most companies currently are in a hybrid structure. There is some data in the data center, some data on the cloud. Um, so this is another area where most job descriptions are not very clear. They would want you to know cloud, but you might have to also work, you know, work in data center. Um, but as you learn AI, it's important you understand basic cloud, understand basic things like the elastic map reduce, the red shift, the EC2, the S3, the differences of each of these. Uh, if you do not intend to become a Hadoop Spark admin, right? So these are the areas which is predominantly in the past was handled by let's say an Oracle DBA or a Unix admin sysadmin. I will move to this, but considering you are a data engineer, data scientist, you should know the differences because, like I said, most of the roles are kind of mixing up, right? 
So you have to be clear as to on-premise, how it's making sense, what is AWS, what is the equivalent in the Google space, equivalent in the Azure space, all the pros and cons, what works where or there. The biggest mistake most companies are doing is they are buying cloud, they're using cloud as a data center, right? Mistakes will keep on happening, right? And it, it's fine that the industry is going to transition and there will be mistakes done and people will evolve as we as mentioned. Because there are no processes today, there is no clear structure today. IOC teams are also confused. Okay. If you see the industry landscape, uh, almost every industry will be touched. Uh, why? Um, anywhere you where you think a computer is getting limited by knowing um, by the business rules. So most of the algorithms we have built in the past, let's say back, were predominantly set of business rules. Step one, step two, step three, step four. Step if not step first, step five. If not step five, go back to step two. Right? In the AI world, the idea is not to make sense of the, make sense of the steps, but the idea is to make sense of the data. In order to make sense of the data, it's a very non-linear approach. Meaning, for example, it's like, I give an example like driving. Right? When you're driving, you don't go out and say that. Uh, okay, some uh, let's say a cow came in front of you. You don't say that. Okay, our oh, cow came. Okay, break, right? Or should I drive faster? You don't say that. Uh, what you basically do is uh, you go out and you have multiple data points: people walking in, people walking out, the speed of your car, the cow coming in, how fast is the car, cow moving out, the traffic in the road, the potholes on the road. All data points come together to decide, and that's where the industry is moving. And hence, AI comes into the picture. World, all data will be a non-linear approach of decision making. So step one, step two, step three will not work. In most industries will be this. So retail, for example, retail, if you go to a shop, all non-linear data points will come together. Okay. All right. Now someone's again sound is breaking up. Uh, okay. So um, most of the industries where there is predictive modeling. What is predictive modeling? Uh, Imagining, not imagining, imagine wrong word. So, uh, determining, again, determining is wrong word, trying to forecast the future and take decisions in alignment with that. Okay. Based on the past experience, seeing what in the future and systems and processes and people in that world. For example, when you walk to a store, Sometimes we always just think, right? What if, what if the shopkeeper already always knows what I will come for? Let's say in the older days when you're smaller shops and your personal relationship with the person, let's say you go to a shop every month asking for a, you know, box of tea. And the shopkeeper knew you every month. You come and ask for a tea by default. You like that particular flavor of tea, and he gives you that tea. Uh, what happened is we built the supermarkets, large, bigger supermarkets where the personal connect got lost. This personal connect will come back again using AI. So when you walk into a store, the person will not know, sadly, but the computer would know that you walk in every month asking for a tea bag. And let's give him a tea, box tea to work. Uh, so, and that's true with healthcare, life sciences. So let's say every month you take a particular medication. Every medication has an effect on you can track your health to see if your medication is making an impact. There can be a feedback loop to make sure your diet and your exercise is taken care of, and all the weapons can come together. In energy, right? Uh, we waste so much of energy, right? Um, things like if you walk in, the light is pretty normal nowadays, right? But optimizing it at a large scale, uh, making sure you have a lesser carbon footprint is optimized. And services, I think one of the industries which is most mature in statistical modeling in financial services, predominant insurance, banking risk, credit risk, they have been doing statistical modeling for years, for decades, right? Uh, they have they have so many rules uh, already in place, right? Um, they are now evolving into the much larger scale because the data segments. Travel, hospital, of course, if you see aircraft scheduling, so many people, congestion, traffic, governments come into picture in this, manufacturing, all this will require, wherever there is an opportunity to predict modeling, the industry is well served. All right. So this is the most corporate worlds. There is another set of jobs requirements where you will see in startups. 
all kinds of startups, right? Uh, healthcare, financials, analytic pro product, uh, all kinds. Uh, again, all this will again converge pretty soon, uh, but until it converges, it will be kind of a messed up area. Thankfully, VC funding and all that, most startups are working on very new ideas. They're challenging the status quo. They're doing a lot of good things. Um, and where do they require AI? Most of the startups have two paths to it. There's a part which is the full stack development, right? A full stack developer, the Node.js, React, putting full stack development. But most startups also have a foundational data piece because they realize that as they go forward, they will have to use the data and make their product richer and make make it their B2C connect, make to B2B connect richer. For to make them richer, the data has to be there. So data is no longer an afterthought. Data is the first data first approach. That's where again AI will come into picture. So they will start building Hadoop players to start with. There will be simple app in the front, but in the back of it, there will be different data ops, Hadoop layer, um, Python layer, Scala layer working on this. Two clear segments where you can look for jobs. Um, one is the corporates, the large corporates, which are in this data journey, who are moving from the legacy world to the data world. They have a lot of money, they have a lot of budget, but they don't know how to go about it. They have hired some good guys, uh, predominantly from really good companies with strong PhDs and all that, um, but they want to build their teams, right? Uh, while startup world, very fast moving, very intense worlds, but they're also building the data layer because they want to go to the, the see world is the data world. Right now, um, you are new to the AI space and you are moving into the AI space. What you should do, okay? See here, you start. Um, you ideally start at here at the supervised learning layer. This is more statistics. Ideally, why you might not be like I said, all the three roles are very, very mixed up data engineer, the big data architect and a Hadoop player and competitors and all mixed up three layers. Um, so this is a layer which is predominantly the data science engineer layer, right? Supervised learning, so regression, classification, statistics, something which is a big, big time here. Um, slowly and slowly the relevance will go down of this, but you still have to know because most of the basic questions will still come from this place. Okay. Unsupervised learning. Um, Companies who have slightly matured in the AI path play in the unsupervised space. Okay. From an interview perspective, we'll not get a lot of questions in this area. Because this question, um, not many companies have really done it very well in this area. Predominantly, if you see clustering and all that, because it's very difficult to explain. That's why people are not comfortable. Okay. Deep learning, right? This is where will move it. For example, like I said, computer vision, natural language processing, all will come to picture here. Right? Postman learning centers. These are all advanced topics, right? So you should start to start your learning here in the supervised statistical layer, move into unsupervised clustering, and then move into deep learning. Can you go directly here? You can. You can. If um, you are in the product, you're targeting product companies or startups. You are better off going directly into deep learning space rather than into supervised and supervised learning. Right? Predominantly targeting um, EFSI, uh, retail, farm, all those large corporates, you are better off going to supervised learning first. Okay, makes sense. Now, technology is learning path, right? So, like I said, Apache Spark is something which you should know. This is the bottom, uh, which was traditionally the Access admin DBA layer. Um, Spark has it's more, I mean, simplistically put, it's not exactly like that, but very well made architecture. Most companies have a Spark layer. Uh, they do not work on Hadoop directly, they usually work through Spark. Um, so, you should know Spark. Obviously, you should know Spark with some background on the cloud as to how Spark works on cloud. So, in EMR, three things like that. From a programming language perspective, the most popular Python. Um, obviously, Python is very easy to learn compared to the traditional, let's say, the Java days. Significantly easy to learn, um, but 
but most python or currently used by data scientists not as much by data engineer you have to know python because you will use it more from explore data, data analyst perspective but not from an um, most of the most of the production code should be written in scala rather than python because scala is performance is much stronger much more stable and scala works very closely with spark uh, so large volumes of data being processed today is done mostly on scala rather than python because the performance and the speed and the scalability is much higher in scala r if you are not a university student right there is no reason why you should do r r is as powerful as python is but cn is mostly being used by phd guys from universities they are very comfortable you guys across universities work r rather than python and because more scientific it's it's very good for statistical machine learning um, so most phd guys work in r. Um, but the industry has, has very little r so you would see hardcore data scientists using r, right um, kind of the mid type data scientists using python most data engineers and programmers will be using on the scala while the scala guys will also know python python is easy to learn tensorflow is is by google it is mostly used for deep learning and natural neural networks uh, you you will see that more and more going forward interesting okay uh, these are the interesting thing you have to be very hands on um, unlike in the past uh, even senior guys have to be very very hands on um, why because every job you join there will be a lack of resources um, like you right not many people who have done enough training have done to project on live projects live engagements so the, you will always fall short of resources and delivering important projects most projects are strategic projects where they want to make a shift uh, i as executive vice president i am hands on in fact yesterday i was learn, learning druid and imply pivot so um, to be strongly hands on knowing what's happening uh, to as much detail as possible the more the better so you, that's why you will see most of the guys asking for phd's because the assumption is most phd's are hands on right um, so you have to be very very hands on no matter how senior you are right which is good and bad the good thing is because um, technology really makes you see the results it gives you a good feeling i'm like that it gives you a good feeling as a company and the bad thing is if you are a senior guy you're expected to do all the things which you do as a senior guy and so on sometimes it becomes very difficult sometimes it becomes very tiring to do them together so uh, be conscious around that. but to be hands on yes uh yeah so i spoke about the organization needs job preparation jobs in preparation so to be, you have to be taking care of all the three aspects you have to be knowing spark to some extent and you're knowing mongodb postgres um, new databases like druid house knowing what the databases do the differences between spark hadoop map reduce hive you're knowing all this that layer you also should be knowing from the etl layer how to make a data lake what makes a data lake uh, that and, and then some data science layer from a python perspective you're knowing statistics uh, in so many ways the company is expecting a superman uh, but what is what is your speciality um, be open and honest saying that i am more better in this layer so you can say that i am, I am more better in the hadoop spark layer but i am i am very good in scala i am not good as a statistician right um, and you can be open um, even if you join the job you will see that your role will shift very fast unlike the past your role should very very fast uh, you will be expected to all the three you will be expected to know Spark, Spark, Hadoop, you will be expected to know Python, you will be expected to know Scala, you will be expected to know statistics, you will be expected to know all the complete stack until this ecosystem evolves. Forward. Okay. I think I'm quickly out of time. Um, I'll open up for questions. Uh, okay. So those are, that's my Twitter handle and that's my LinkedIn profile. And uh, all right, I'll open for questions. And let's discuss what do you have in your mind. Thanks, Sudhir, for the hello. Uh, thanks for the presentation. That was really good. And let's open up for the QA. If anyone has questions, please uh, type in the chat with all.
transmission. Coming, but uh, maybe I'll, I'll kind of continue with my discussion until the questions come up pretty fast. Sure. So, sure. Yeah. So broadly, um, uh, as you, the challenge is, some companies will hire you without relevant project experience. Some companies will need project experience, and that's a part where most people will struggle because um, the challenges you face in a live project, while compared to challenges you face in a in the training world is very different. Um, like I mean, when you were learning Oracle, the employee database was always perfect, right? You can always query everything will come out. But doing real world data, the data is very unclean. It's not good. Uh, all that comes into picture. Um, so, what would help uh, if you do not have project experience is to understand the industry you are applying for and try to see if what are the use cases people have run in the past and at least demonstrate your knowledge of the challenges and solutions around it. Okay, rather than going walking and saying that I'm just a trained guy. Um, what would also help is if you're able to, um, if you're able to, let's say, in, in when you're doing some training, let's say on Udemy or Coursera or Edica or Anthelithia or whatever, you know, all those technologies, platforms, um, all the platforms are very good. Uh, and most, most, in most cases, you would do three, four in each of the good at it because practice on the same topics by, by four different players um, but, um, but you, you start understanding as to what makes sense from a project perspective uh, ideally you should let's say you don't have experience you, you pick up the right project uh, which enough publicly available data sets if you go to Kaggle K -A -G -G -L -E, data sets and download a lot of data and, and make it work right uh, so I have a question here. So does companies hire professors for data science roles? And does learning data science a good choice for us? Uh, yes. Uh, yes to both. Yes. Do hire professors for data science roles. Um, the professors who are more from a uh, computer engineering or programming language background compared to non-programming language engineering background for as okay. um, uh, what I what we have seen personally I've seen personally is um, most statisticians let's say MSc statistics they have very good knowledge of statistics but they're weak on the programming side which is pretty normal which is not wrong which is right uh, computer engineering side no good programming but they don't understand data science as much so it's, it's important that they uh, the professors understand a bit more statistics, a little bit more. You don't have to be really good. Uh, but take a step further to understand what data scientist is. It's not very difficult. Um, if you go through some decent books, you'll get all the basics right in very simple ways. Thanks to YouTube and Coursera and all that, a lot of enough statistics courses to go through. Um, learning, data, learning data science is a good choice. Of course it is. Uh, you love it. I loved it. when I When I started learning data science like six, uh, five years back, five, six years back, um, been long, 12 years started learning data science. And it's like seven years right now, yeah, <laughs> old, yeah. So uh, I loved, I'll tell you why I loved it, because it's it's amazing to see how industries will shift from the current stage to the new stage in the data world. So you love it. And if you love it, you, you will do it much better than that. Yeah, I mean this question. Um, I have a Java JTV Spring developer and no AWS. Uh, learned blockchain last year. Now I'm reading about big data machine learning with all this so many technology keeping into primary skills strong becomes very true. So primary skills becomes very difficult sometimes. Like I said, industry is kind of mixed. It is like it is like developer when you were in 1990s when the computer industry was just warming up, right? When Oracle Java or all to not Java, Java is a little bit later, but Oracle, um, C, C++ are all together, right? Um, Today is a much bigger scale. So it's very difficult to keep track of the um, core technologies to specialist in. 
how do you maintain balance um, most read every weekend fantastic that's the key right industry will shift uh, keep on doing what you are doing don't stop next five years uh, all these things you're learning be it science be it blockchain be it ws be it a2e spring javascript it will all converge in the next five years but until then this industry will be fuddled only from a job perspective right it's important to position yourself as one right but the guy who knows all is uh, i would love to hire in so many ways right because it is if all the breadth not many people have all the breadth right right uh, aws and big data um, yeah so aws uh, the challenge with aws is uh, I, the good thing for aws is it's not not very expensive to go in and start experimenting right not very expensive but by that i mean it's, it's relative term a couple of dollars let's say if you budget of let's say 1000 rupees you can do a lot of good things in aws and experiment a lot of things um, especially around emr and s3 and things like that there are a lot of good youtube videos they show you what to do or not to do uh, AWS and big data. Um, the key thing you have to know from an AWS big data perspective is that, as like I said, most companies struggle from moving from data center to a cloud world. AWS is cloud. Um, you have to know each area of AWS and how each area of AWS is different, right? So where does S3, play? where does EMR play, where does EC2 play, where does Redshift play, where does SageMaker play, where does IAM play from a security perspective? Um, what are the jobs, what are the batches? You have to know all that from in individually and see how they're different. Oracle, DBA, Java, not Java, I mean, world. Um, second thing you should start knowing is ingest large amounts of data. You want to focus on that layer, you want to ingest large amounts of data. Uh, from a machine learning perspective, um, AWS has a platform called AWS SageMaker. Which is very good and very powerful. I have used it. Uh, we don't use it on a live environment here, um, but we use it uh, as more AWS as more as a virtual machines. Um, but it is very powerful, especially for learning machine learning. Uh, it's very powerful uh, because it, it is it, the setup is there, the algorithms are there. You can explain a lot of things and and things around it. Um, excuse me. But SageMaker still works on Python. You have to know Python and Jupyter well enough to be working on SageMaker. So I would suggest you start working, if you want to learn machine learning, start working in Python independently first, then gears and move into AWS SageMaker to see how it's different and what are the advantages and disadvantages of it. Because if you start from AWS SageMaker, you might be too biased towards it. You might think the world is so much so easy. It's not that easy. So you learn the core programming first, then move to. It's like moving from, let's say, C++ to let's say Visual C++, right? If you start learning from Visual C++, you think that, oh, C++ is so easy. But if you start, if you start learning from C++, you'll exactly know the differences, okay? Because company prefers commerce and MBA background people to test these jobs. Uh, as of now, very open to you. As of now, no. Okay. Mm, having said that, having said that, because there is a lack of resources in the market, if you are able to demonstrate your knowledge, your education will not become a limitation. Right? Um, so if you have learned well enough, right, you are you can if you position yourself as a data scientist, because you have a commerce MBA background, um, you, you should have very much stronger finance education. So size space. Uh, you can position yourself as someone who can understand, let's say, how a credit risk modeling would work in the data scientist world. So you demonstrate that knowledge much stronger. Uh, there's there is a much there is a huge demand in BFSI and in fintech for people who know finance and data science together. And the, the problem with the traditional people who have worked in BFSI is that they mostly work on statistical modeling, credit risk, and things like that, but they have not as fast into the data science space you can be that bridge you can say that hey i know bfsi and data science together which will be a big help. Uh, 
Um, okay, another question. I will be taking. I have knowledge of machine learning and data data. And I have some. And okay, and okay. What extra skills should I acquire? Yeah. So uh, okay, deep learning. Great. Okay, makes sense. So um, that's great. I mean, if you have no, if you know machine learning and deep learning. Um, I would suggest you join a startup. Why? Most startup who are focused on deep learning and machine learning will actually get you to do machine learning and deep learning much more than large corporates will do today. Right? Like I said, most large corporates are, are struggling with this whole concept. They are using most large corporates are are using startups as their vendors to solve the deep learning problem rather than develop it themselves. Right? So you are better off in a startup if you are really passionate about the deep learning space. Right? Um, if you are kind of the guy who is, uh, no, I think considering what uh, in CS, it's good to you. And, and, the, and the learnings you get in a startup from a deep learning perspective, you can use it elsewhere, right? Uh, possibly can do a PhD on this later on too. So master later on. So I would suggest join a startup. Experience is good. Certified in engineer and master program. That's good. Okay. Yeah, thing is this. Um, yeah, that's a challenge. Uh, when I go through CVs, um, I value skills who have come from SAP BW background. Um, the place where I struggle with um, those CVs from a CV perspective is they're very SAP heavy, right? Um, while the data science world, you have to tune the CV to make it business friendly, uh, mostly around what are the problems you you can solve or will solve in the data world. The past experience, right? Um, I've seen like your CV, right? Let's say the CV would, would be there'll be SAP everywhere, SAP Project One, SAP Project Two, SAP Project Three, SAP Project Four, and data science certification, right? Um, what you are better off doing is you are rather than saying SAP project one, try to see how you did the same project in the data world, right? For example, even the SAP BW space should run so many work on, let's say, data ETL right? from taking data from multiple systems and doing right? um, and or some data visualization or some decision, decision making uh, solving, right? Try to see. Bring that flavor onto that project rather than just writing as a beautiful project. Not everyone gets it, right? So bring that flavor, uh, because uh, sadly in India uh, your certificates are not as the early ones have been not valued as much. In the past, so most of our our sense, right? Uh, in the past, most certifications were done using dumps. <laughs> you would know that, right? <laughs> yeah. So. Um, today, when the CIO or CTO looks at a guy who has AI ML certification, sometimes they realize how difficult it is compared to the because most AI ML certificates goes through a project, goes through understanding, right? So they think that just like the Oracle certifications or the Java certifications, um, similarly certified certification value has not grown up as high. Unless it is an AWS solution architect or a Google certified solution architect, like that, right? Um, only those are much valued today compared to, let's say, other certifications. So you are better off retaining your just go back and look at past projects and see if your past projects had a data angle to it. Portray the data angle and and give and kind of take a drop down, take a paper and see as to what are the things you did on the data. If you the same project, if you from a data perspective alone, what are the key things you'll take care of, right? Uh, and highlight that; it will help you. Okay. Yeah, I know these courses are like super crazy. I mean, like the, the, the good thing about internet is there is. 
availability of knowledge, it's amazing. I mean, we would not be talking if there was not so much information, available, right? I mean, every blog you see, every conference, everything, you, every, everyone is speaking about AI, ML. There are enough courses on AI, ML. I mean, some of the Stanford courses are available free for you on YouTube, free. Someone has recorded the complete computer science course and put it on the, on the YouTube. It's amazing. I mean, sitting in India, you can hear to Stanford, you know, Stanford professors talking about AI, ML and teaching you through it. So it's absolutely amazing. But there's so much knowledge. If when you go to an interview like uh, data science, data learning, deep learning, machine learning, anyone can ask you anything, right? It's a vast, big field now. That makes it very difficult to prepare well. Um, sadly, right? So you are better off not to focus that way. Better off that, uh, like I said, go to go back to if you do the same project in the data world, how you do it, and think of it. Think of your resume as a set of projects rather than a set of certificates, set of learnings. For example, you might be very good in DevOps, big data, and AWS, but you might say that big data, that's not coming out, it's bad. You have to kind of say that this is where I can do AWS, this is where I can do big data, this is where I can do DevOps, okay? Give that angle to it. Okay. Yeah, I know, I mean, I, I have to learn so much. Like I said, I, I'm learning right now, testing a set of databases. There are three databases called uh, there is Druid, Apache, ClickHouse, and you know, all the three are time series based databases. They are specifically meant for time series applications, right? Uh, there's visualization layer on it, let's say there's Apache Superset, there is Imply Pivot, which works on all the three databases to see us to, to visualize the time series data. Uh, very specific use case, very specific problems these data are, databases are solving. Learning that um, because uh, I have a use case which which requires that kind of knowledge. You have to learn, right? Good, but you know what the sad part is? Let's say um, anyone I talk to um, and I ask them a question around. If I'm asking them a question around Pino or a Druid or ClickHouse, they won't know. Uh, the problem is just because I know it doesn't mean that the other person has to know. Right? It's wrong expectation from interviewer. The interviewer has to hire it for the person that has worked on, it was relevant to you, right? But learning is something which I have to do. This next five years will be, will be crazy. Be crazy learning, learning, learning. Um, <laughs> I think gone are the days when you can become a boss and you know, people, there is army of people working for you. Not anymore, right? Especially in the data world, uh, not because people cannot hire, um, because you cannot hire, you cannot hire hundred data scientists, for example. I mean, what you, what is the business case for it, right? Always find it. It'll be very smaller teams, smaller data scientists, smaller data engineers can do it. So you have to be hands on. You have to keep on learning. But as the industry converges, thing will help you, right? Just like in the SAP days, right? When you started SAP, uh, you must be wondering, oh man, SAP is so huge. You can do so many things, right? You can do NetWeaver, you can do ABAP, you can do BW, you can do, I mean, everything, the whole lot, from FICO to everything, right? Um, but it will converge. It will slowly, slowly becoming converged from it. Right? Okay. Very good. Yeah, guys, so keep on learning. Uh, all the stacks are open. You have to know about Spark, you have to know about data engineering, you have to know about data scientists, all the three layers. Um, companies are expecting to hire Superman, which is difficult. Um, and, and I'll tell you some background. I'll, I'll tell you why expecting Superman. Because companies don't know what to wear. Bluntly put, right? Um, most companies are struggling with the use case itself. They don't even know different between cloud and DC. They've got the jargons that is elastic and scalable and all that, but they don't actually use it properly. Uh, they don't know TL and ELT and what the differences are. You know, understand different between MongoDB and PostgreSQL, how different from 
what is document database what is a column database they talk about it but they don't know much um, for them every statistics is machine learning every, every machine learning is statistics it's confusing um, the most of the confusion is, is created by the leaders in the company who do not know data science or data engineering or cloud right so keep on learning we'll leave there Thanks a lot, Sudeep. I think this was a great session and I think those answers really helped all the learners here. Great. I'm glad to help. Um, so you get a lot for again taking out the time at in Saturday at 12 noon. Yeah, sure. It was a great experience. Um, you can you can reach out to me on LinkedIn or you can reach out to me on uh, Twitter. Uh, sure. Let's be in touch. Yep. Thank you. I'll, I'll take a follow up from them and forward to you also. Thanks a lot, Sudeep. Now I'm ending the meeting and thanks a lot for your time. Bye-bye. Thank you.